Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I want to apologize for people sitting in the back. I'm not sure if all the fonts are large enough, so if you don't see the code, maybe move closer. I also want to thank All Things Open for organizing this conference, inviting so many great speakers. And I'm a little scared, to be honest. Like, I've done presentations before, but following Kent and Scott is kind of like, I'm afraid a bunch of you will be disappointed. But just remember, when you eat very tasty sushi, where it's ginger, what you eat at the end, to kind of cleanse your palate, I'm the ginger today, okay? And sometimes you find this little green, like seagrass, and you eat that, and then figure out it's plastic. So don't that's Okay, uh, tips and tricks for writing fast and maintainable front-end tests. It's the longest title I've ever used in my presentation. And you'll see why. There's a trick to it. Because yesterday was Halloween. And I wanted to be like Ken Siddharth. You know how at the beginning he's like, okay, let's stretch and do like, you know. And unfortunately, yesterday I played soccer when I went trick-or-treating and when I went to the airport. And I think this combination really killed my legs today. Like, I'm in so much pain after sitting inside the airplane. Usually it doesn't happen, so no stretching. Just try to deal with it. Okay, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. Before I begin, we are in a very dangerous situation. Don't believe me, like, just listen to any climate scientist. They ring alarm bells. I think what you can do this week before next Tuesday or on Tuesday, the most important thing you can do is vote. I don't care what party you vote to, but I would suggest you go and you look at an environmental organization endorsement. That's it. Okay, I'm Gleb Akhmutov. I had a long career from C++ and C Sharp to CoffeeScript and JavaScript. Now I do a lot of open source work, especially in regards to testing. I worked for a long time at a company called Cypress.io, where we build open test runner. Um, I have my own blogs and YouTube channel now because everyone has to be a YouTuber. And my son, who only watches YouTube, and he's like, oh, this person has two million followers. How many do you have? And I was like, uh, a little bit fewer, but. I do like to share everything that I've done, like, you know, even posting courses. Day to day, I work at Mercari US subsidiary. Mercari is an online marketplace. Apparently, a lot of people know it. I didn't know before I joined, but you can take a picture of anything you no longer use and sell it. To me, it's good for environment, because you don't manufacture a thing, you reuse it. But day to day, what we're doing, we're writing end-to-end -end tests. So, I apologize for small size, but it shows the test in action. Running in Cypress test, where you see the commands in the left column, they're a little like clicking on buttons, they're checking you know, the URL transitions, they're checking that specific text appears, and you can see the application running in the right column. It's an actual browser actually showing how, for example, in this case, a user is finishing a transaction to buy, and then the seller and the buyer, they communicate and exchange messages. Now, I've been with the company for um, probably a year and a half. I specifically came because they asked me to help them write end-to-end -end tests. They had two attempts previously to write end-to-end -end tests. They both failed for a very variety of reasons. I'm not going to go into details. But this is our history of our test size. This end-to-end -end test, as you can see, they keep growing and growing and growing. Now we're almost at 700 full-featured end-to-end tests that run the browser. Here's the first part. When people talk about front-end tests, what do they mean? And I will start my opinion of front-end tests with majority of people are wrong. Majority of people, when they talk about front-end tests, run them using just, using just dump. They run them in Node. Call me crazy. But I believe that if you're writing a test for something that's supposed to run in a browser, you should be running it in a browser. Right? We all agree? Thank you. 
Just today I saw this tweet. Hey, extra fast version of JSDAM. JSDAM is already fast because it marks everything. It's not a real browser. And now you want to mark even more. This is craziness. If you do this, where you import JSDAM, some kind of test utils, and you start calling synthetic mouse, click, bubble through, you're already lost. You're already not doing what a real browser would do. You probably are not testing what you think you're testing. So, there is only one thing that you can take from this presentation. You're writing node code, test it in node. You're writing code that's supposed to run in a browser, you test it in all together now. Okay, I'm done. No, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, let's see some tests, because it's all fun and games until you actually have to write a test. Uh, I'm gonna use this little Sudoku application. I don't wanna show Mercari tests, because they're complicated. I'll show some of them, but this is a Sudoku game, everyone played it. You wanna fill all the rows and columns. The numbers don't repeat from one to nine. So how would you, for example, check that little difficulty selector? You can select which version of a game you wanna play. Easy, medium, hard. Well, you would install Cypress. It's an NPM install. You would start your application. Now, this depends on your application, obviously. Your application might have been already deployed somewhere. So then you don't have to start it. You open Cypress, and you pick what type of a task you want to write. Let's say you pick end-to-end, -end because to me, end-to-end -end is what matters, really, at the end of the day. And you say, okay, localhost 3000 will be my base URL, because I don't want to hard code it in every source file. And then you write a test, and again, I apologize, but bear with me. We're gonna visit that base URL. That means in real browser, we're gonna go to that page. We're gonna make sure it loads. It's already built, all these checks are built in. And then we'll say, okay, initially the difficulty element should have text easy. And then you can check how many cells are filled on the game board. Then we can change it to medium difficult. The board will reset itself, and now there'll be fewer field cells. So it's harder to play. And then we're gonna change the difficulty level to hard and check how many cells there are. So we're not checking the, you know, what's inside the implementation, we're just checking what the user sees on the page. And the test looks like this. And it goes very quickly, but then I can hover over each command in the left column, and I can see how the page looked at that particular moment. I can see which cells they were filled. I can make sure that it really does what you think it should do. The key element of a front-end test, you wanna see what's happening. The real user, the real human user. One of the problems, I believe, what many people now realize with let's say just snapshots or Ava snapshots, I implemented snapshot libraries. You test in a blind kind of scenario, in node. You take your element, component, and you say, okay, you match snapshot, and you get this huge wall of HTML. You have no idea what it actually represents in the browser. So you save it, and the next time something changes, you're like, I have no idea what it actually changes, in the browser, so you like blindly update, update, update. No, you want to see what the test does and how it all looks. Okay. Testing the difficulty selector is easy, right? You just click, change, and so on. How about the gameplay itself? How would you actually play the game? Well, this is the hard part. Because the game is random, right? You don't control it. It's actually hard to test it end-to-end -end and hard to play it. Well, me being a genius, both, I said, okay, there is a hint button. Instead of playing game myself, my test can constantly click the hint button. So we visit the page, we check the number of field cells, we take every cell that uh, has a field, we click on it, and then we click the hint. Click on the empty cell, click the hint. So this is how it would look. Empty cell, click on the hint. And it fills that cell. And then we just verify that we win the game. 
This is how the test runs. Click, 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 and goes through the whole thing. Right? So actually play the game. Is it a good test? Okay, so sometimes I teach testing workshops and I ask questions like this. Is this a good test when I'm showing this? The answer is always no. Always no. There's always something, you know, a trick or a joke. So no, it's not a good test. It's a good test for hint functionality, right? But even that hint produced some garbage, smiley faces. And my game was broken and accepted smiley faces, it was still passed. So the things that make end-to-end -end tests hard are data like that, randomly generated, data that comes from external systems, timers, locks, conditional tests. Never do conditional testing. If you must do conditional testing, like look at a page, if a page has this message when you click one button, if it doesn't have that message when you click something else, don't do that. You must ask me, I'll tell you how to do it, but don't do it. And also, unclear test requirements. Oftentimes people like write a test for this, and you ask them, what should the test do in particular situation? And they say, I, uh, just click on the first user. And you're like, Will it be one user? They're like, eh, probably. Okay, so timers, right? Something that makes testing difficult. Right? Time stamps, dates. So how would you test the timer element in this case? Well, you can write a test like this that just says, okay, it should show zero, zero, column, zero, one, zero, zero, you know, seconds. So it kind of looks like this. And I apologize that you don't see it, but it really checks one, two, three, every second. What about, does the timer work after 15 minutes? Can it format a longer duration? Well, I can wait in my test for 15 minutes and then check, right? I mean, we've all written tests where we're like, ah, just add a wait and then who cares, right? But there must be a better way. Honestly, my whole career, is just asking myself this question and, and thinking like, this is wrong, like this can't be the best thing, like let's write something and, and make it better, right? So let's go back. We kind of started with end-to-end -end tests, but let's go back to the unit testing, like testing the smallest parts of code. How do we do that? So in the same timer component, there is a function that formats the time. You give it hours, seconds, and minutes, and it gives you a string, right? How would you test that? Well, you would import it from your unit test, and then you would give it different arguments. For example, you could give it format seconds free, and it should give you zero, zero, column, zero, three. Right? Grab the function, call it with arguments, check the result, matches what you expected. And you know, Cypress can also run it in a browser. Fine. Now, let's go back to the thinking about the component that actually shows it on the page. Not the function that formats it, but the component. Here's what I would love to do. Better way. Import, not a function, but the component. Put it on a page, let it render itself, and let it actually count the time on, so I can see it. I would not call it unit test, I would call it component. Component being smallest unit of a framework. Components like React component, Angular, Svelte, unit, all these like little blocks. This is what I want to test. Somehow take the code that renders itself on the page and runs, and just boom, confirm that it works. Well, that's kind of tricky because now my testing tool has to understand React. Before I visited the page and I did not care what framework actually was implementing. Right? But now I have to know because I need to actually be able to take that component, bundle it, and bootstrap, scaffold, and put it on the page. We're not visiting the URL anymore. Who has been to Kansas? Okay, okay, well, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is it. So this is something that, if I'm being per per perfectly humble and honest, I started many years ago. A way to take a component from a framework 
and put it on a page of the Cypress and continue testing. So now it's part of official Cypress. Instead of end-to-end, -end, you pick component, and now you have to actually tell Cypress, I'm using React, right? I'm using Vue, you know, all of this like major framework. And it says, okay, in my config file, I'm using create React app, and the bundler is this thing. So it knows how to bundle things when you do use import. And now, the test looks almost the same thing. You import your component timer. Instead of a function, you import the whole timer, and then there is a sign mount. So instead of say visit Kansas, you say sign mount, and here's my component, and you can use GSX, pass props, all the things that you do in your normal application when you use the timer component. But guess what? After you mount, it starts running as a mini web application. And now you can use normal commands, but not look at the specifics of the code, but instead they look at the page. They interact with the component like, like normal external application. You don't look into the specifics implementation, you just look at HTML elements, the attributes, local storage, network communication, and so on. And this is how the test looks. Well, it doesn't look, right? Because you cannot see it, so don't worry. I'll share the slides URL later, and it's full resolution, you'll be able to see it. But basically, you can see just that component working right there. Now, a couple of things about it. I'm not visiting the full URL, that means it's super fast, right? Because it only has to bundle that little component and its tiles, and boom, it's there. So 58 milliseconds. It's not as fast as Jest, because Jest doesn't do any of it, right? But it's very fast to actually work while you work with your code, to actually see it and maybe even spend more time testing it than writing the code itself. It's a live application, you can open DevTools like I'm doing here, you can see every node, everything. Install like React DevTools, so you can see things, you can see, like, you can see the properties changing. And still, you can go through the test commands and see the snapshots of how that component look at every step of the test. So you can see how it's To me, the best thing, you actually see what you're developing. Because the styles are all applied. Like in a previous example, I imported the global styling, and I'll mention the styling in the next slide as well. But it's powerful. Imagine you're developing something more complicated, like a date picker. How many of you have implemented some kind of a date picker? Exactly, we should start a support group for them. Many people, date pickers, have, well, what's it, STDs for Pacific time zone, right? Like, problem. It's very difficult, but imagine you see it, right? And you can set it up in a da with data and the state you want, and just see how it looks and how it handles, for example, a leap year. Okay, one big thing is that Cypress, because you told it which framework you're using, it will understand how to mount and start your component. You can also apply styling, right? And styling could be global, like in this case, up on top. I'm actually importing app.css. Because my normal Create React app knows how to import CSS files, bundle and set them up. I can do the same for my test. And I can surround my component with the DOM structure so that the global styles apply. Plus the component's own styles, if it has any local scopes of style, also apply. So that if I don't do that, well, under the green, it's just the text. The component still works, it just doesn't have any styles. But if you import the styles correctly, then it looks like a component on the page. So you understand how it looks. And I'll give you even more. How many of you are using Storybook? Exactly. You use Storybook because you want to see how component looks in different resolutions with different props, right? Same thing. You can take, you know, clone your test, 
use different props, different styles, different viewport sizes, and you will see how your date picker behaves and looks in all the different versions. Now, what about the data? The component, like the timer is simple, right? Usually it just has zero, zero and starts counting. But in this component, you can pass when the game started. So you immediately go to like 10 minutes pass, and then it keeps counting. Think how would you pass data to your React component in your application. You can have props, or you can have context provider. You can also use like local storage, you know, all, all the other mechanisms. You do the same thing in your test. The test becomes almost like a mini documentation tool for your component. Your component is hard to set up from the test. It probably will be hard to set up in your normal application. In this case, I'm passing a Sudoku provider, and i passing when the game has started. OK. So we looked at format function for the time. We looked at the timer component, but our application is like a tree. Right? You have components that assemble other components all the way to the game component and then the app. A pyramid. So in this case, why don't we look at the numbers? So the numbers is what you see on the right side from the game board. That's where you pick one for nine, right? So how can you test that? Same thing. You import the numbers. You can use context provider to show the selected number currently, and you can pass an on-click prop, which you know, is built in into the type seen on stop. Now, huge, huge thing, and I, you know, I have a slide separate. When you mount the component, you use something framework specific, like context provider, the prop. After that, it starts running. After that, you use normal Cypress commands, like click, you know, assertions, and so on. So the top, when you mount the component, it's something framework specific, after that, normal commands. You can use them in end-to-end -end tests or component tests. In this case, uh, we confirm the selected number as a certain class, and then we click on it, and we can confirm that it executes the prop on-click handler. And it shows the same test. So we can see the selected number, right? We know it has the expected class applied, and we know that if we click, physically click on the page, it falls with that number on click handler. Which brings me to another point. Many, many years ago, I used QUnit, and then AngularJS came on board, and I had to learn AngularJS specific syntax, and then I had to learn AngularJS specific testing tools. I even wrote my own wrapper because I was tired of remembering this specific syntax. Then, let's say Vue came on board, and I love Vue, and I learned Vue syntax, which was kind of similar, but the testing tools were very different. So I had to learn both testing tools. Then React came on board, so I had to learn React and React testing tools, and then Svelte, and Svelte testing tools. None of, the none of the knowledge and time that I invested in learning AngularJS specific testing tools paid off. I already forgotten all of it. They never actually helped me learn view testing tools or React testing tools and so on. So imagine me trying to be good at, let's say, React, but also having to know how to write React-specific testing code. Like, don't make me, make me learn one more testing library, one more specific way of clicking on the button. Right? So don't make me learn this. What is act? How do I click on the button? I just want to click. I don't want to dispatch an event and remember its property. Which brings me to another point. Because once we mount the component, we interact with it using normal click, select, assertions. The API, for example, for Cypress, has been, I would say, polished over many iterations of end-to-end -end testing. So if now, I take, for example, 
angular component test using angular test harness. We've harnessed, without harness, whatever, right? And I look how the same test can be implemented using Cypress where you just click, right? It collapses. Not only I already know it, but 50% of the testing code is completely obliterated. If you don't believe me, let's look at React. Same code that looks at like, I think like some counter toggle and clicks it once, confirms that the on call, on click property was called and then clicks five more times and then confirms it was called. This is it. Left is React testing tools, right is Cypress where you just literally mount it and then click it and that's it. Okay, so front end testing code. We have three choices, unit, component, and to end. The type of a test you write well, depends on what you're testing, right? So small chunks of code like a function, a class, it's a unit test, right? Because they don't touch the DOM. As soon as you start touching the DOM, you have to pick what's the best test, component or end-to-end, -end, right? If you're just trying to test the date picker, you probably want to write component test, a specific thing where you set up different props and see how the component looks and behaves. You want to test the complete web application, backend, frontend, all the services that it collects. You probably want to write all frontend test. With component tests, so easy to test edge conditions. How does my date picker handle leap year, February 29th? How does my date picker do if the date is January negative one? Very hard to set up through end to end. Very easy to set up through a component. End to end, the whole user flow. Can the user make a purchase and communicate via to sell exchange messages? Yeah. Okay, this is all fun and games until you put some numbers on it. Who remembers the testing pyramid? Unit tests, lots of unit tests. Everyone, write a unit test. 10 of them, 100% code coverage. Integration, let's put components together, test them. A few end-to-end -end tests. So at Mercari, after a year, these are the numbers. Unit tests that we write for our front-end code, that test like little functions, all the hooks, all the like logic, 346. The big end-to-end -end test that actually tests user flow through the whole thing, almost 700. Component we're still working on actually implementing this, so that's why it's like work in progress. We completely invert, inverted the pyramid because we think judging by what's appropriate and what gives us the biggest bang for our time investment, the end-to-end -end test is, component test will be something the best of both worlds. Okay. Back to the title. Let's talk about what the fast front end test means, right? Because everyone uses that word incorrectly. First of all, if you want your front end tests like end to end to be fast, you have to avoid using front end. And I'm not saying test it in Node, no. I'm saying that once, for example, you tested creating a user or logging in through a page, like you know, entering username, entering password, clicking submit, you should not do that anymore. All other tests should be able to log in with an API call. They bypass the UI, you tested the UI, so why spend time you know, clicking things and filling it up again and again and again and again? You get no extra confidence, but it just takes time. So we do a lot of it. And I'll give you the original example of bypassing the user UI. The fireman's pole. Do firemen you know how to use a ladder? Some of them do, right? But what do they do to skip it? They use the pole. The same with making a call to log in or create an item and then continuing testing the UI. Caching, right? Every time you create something in the test, 
or making an API call or using a UI, you should cache it, right? Because maybe the next task can just reuse it, the same user and so on. So we have, we've written like a whole library for caching and validating the cache state and so on. Okay, so rule of thumb. We try to keep our end-to-end -end tasks under three minutes. If the whole like, spec file is longer, then we split it up. If the task is too long, we try to see maybe we can speed it up by making some API calls. We still have a huge problem, though. On average, our task is one minute long. We have 700. Math problem. How long is 700 times one minute? The right answer is too long. We cannot wait 12 hours. We actually run all our tests every eight hours. So if single test run takes 12, but we try to run it every eight hours, we are still behind because the previous run is still there. So what do we do? Well, we have to decide how to run this efficiently, right? The answer to running tests on CI efficiently is to parallelize it. Make your task independent, make sure they can all run, let's say in this case on 15 machines, um, this extra long test is our cleanup test. We actually split it up now. This is how it looks in our circle sec configuration. There is a single line that tells how many containers to spin, and that's it. We can have 20 machines, 40, 50, whatever our devs or staging environment can actually handle at a time. Okay. Pop quiz, if we keep all our tests under three minutes, we have 700 tests, and we spin 700 containers by changing this line from 15 to 700. How long do all our tests take to run? Under three minutes, exactly. We just solved the whole testing you know, speed problem. And it's not even dinner yet, right? We can do a lot more. So, rule of thumb, when you work locally on a feature, you just run the task for that feature that you work on. Once you're done, you don't run any more tests. Like, why? Why would you, you know, wait 12 hours? You just push it to CI and let CI do it for you. The majority of people, when they talk about the speed of running tests, they concentrate on this middle little bar, running the test. How long does it take me to run all my tasks? And there's all this medium blog post that, like, this tool is 10 times faster than this tool because when I run this little, bad, simple test, a low wall, it runs in 50 milliseconds. But here it runs in two seconds. Wow, it's like, yes, you know, Nobel Prize right there. Think about all the different aspects of speed. How long does it actually take for you to install and write tests? And you know what determines that? How long it takes a developer to write as meaningful, good test? Who knows? The only factor that matters is if they use the tool before. That's it. You are much faster writing a test using something you've written, like, used before. That's it. That's what whole deterministic, you know, things. And, by the way, which brings me to another problem, which I see again and again. People struggle for days to adopt a new tool because they skipped the whole learning part. They just saw Hello World and started writing a test, and then they're like, oh, this doesn't work. It's like, what are you doing? And they're like, I'm doing this. It's like, that's not how any of this works. Like, invest a little bit of time in actually learning the tool. Running tests, that's what actually people call, you know, how fast the tests are. We just sold it. Meaningful tests should be run in parallel, and then it doesn't really matter. Just the CI setup. The real speed testing comes when you have to debug a failing test or when you have to maintain the test, meaning the feature changes, you have to update the test. That's where the tools really can distinguish themselves. That's where your test either shine or become so annoying that people just delete them and stop testing altogether. This is the real you know, penalty. This is the real speed. How fast can you maintain the test? Which brings me to another word in my title. Maintainable. By someone other than whoever wrote them. This is the key. 
you're one person startup, okay, but and you can maintain your own tent. Inside any large organization, majority of tests, majority of code have to be maintained by someone other than the original offer, and the original offer is no longer working there. Okay? Right now, our industry is going through a period of layoffs, which means a bunch of tests are suddenly orphans. The people who've written them are no longer there. So what are you looking for when you think about maintainable tests? This is, a, this is actual um, Mercari test. I know it's a little bit hard to read, but it, it calls command like sci sign up, sci create listing, sci create another listing, uh, login user, visit page, you know, else. Okay, our pull request for testing, the very first item is the checkbox. And the checkbox says, are the tests readable? Do you honestly feel that someone else reading the test understands the meaning of what is this testing? This is very important. We review our pull request the same thing, the same way we review our code pull request, right? We try to get more people just to look at that, not, not giving a suggestion, but like, is this readable or do you have questions? Do you understand what's happening? We try to keep tests readable by using custom commands like create listing, maybe little utilities, you know, plugins that simplify a lot of code. Now, what we don't do is write page abstraction. And I've seen it again and again. A lot of people say, okay, I need to, for example, log in the user. I'll start by writing a class, user logging page, and every code in my test has to call a method in that page abstraction class. And I was like, no, 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 like, you're writing all these abstractions on top of a page, the users don't benefit from this. Write the test, make sure it's readable. You find the same testing commands again and again, and maybe abstract it into a function, right? Abstract when needed. You still wanna just be able to write the test. So we use custom commands like sign up, create listing, log in, visit a page. And yet, majority of our tests just go to the page, check what there is element, a button, and click. Okay. My favorite rule of maintainable tests. When the test fails and it throws you an error, just make sure that error is good. Right, like someone can understand what has happened and what to do about it. So here's an example. The user is trying to sell something. They fill up this page and they click like, create like draft list. Right, they don't want to you know list the item; they just want to create a draft. And the error at the end in red, and I'll read to you. The location could have been this URL, but was still on the cell. So like did not go to the expected page after you click on it. Now, who will understand what was the meaning of a test and why it did not go to another page? Right? This is the problem. But, but, well, error doesn't actually give me you know, the reason for why it did not go to the expected page. So I run automation group, which means it's me and a couple of other developers we write majority of tests and we actually teach other people how to write tests and we kind of take the first pass at triaging failing tests. I'll explain what we do now, but I'm looking at this test and I see a call right above it between the click and the error. And I said, okay, maybe we clicked on the button, right? That happened, that was successful, but maybe one of those GraphQL calls failed and that's why I did not transition to the next page. Now, who uses GraphQL? Okay, so GraphQL has a huge problem. You know why? HTTP, like normal calls, they have statuses. If it's successful, it would be 200, 201, whatever. GraphQL calls usually are always successful, 
but they usually have a data property that says error. Now, obviously, you don't see that error property, so you have no idea if it was successful or not. You just see, yeah, 200. So unfortunately, you have to code around it. So in our test, we surrounded that button click with like spy on this network call that we know happens on this page when you click create and confirm that it was successful after you click. And then you can check the URL. So now when the same thing fails, it actually gives you a real good message. It says GraphQL call edit draft item mutation failed. Oops, something wrong happened. Okay, now, still cryptic, right? I understand. But it's much, much better than saying, yeah, the URL is wrong. Now at least someone knows the API call failed and which particular API has failed. And now, what happens when it fails? Okay, you are inside large organization, right? If I'm always looking at the end-to-end -end test and something fails like this, I have no idea what to do. Right? QA group in general has no idea what to do. Appropriate team that is working on that particular feature knows what to do and how to investigate things. So what we recently implemented is notification of the team based on the test that failed during the nightly run. What we've done for the tests, we assign tags. So we have tags where, for example, Describe tests that refer to shipping or mobile or payment, all, all this, right? Like 15 categories. Okay? So, for example, in this test, effective tags would be shipping and sanity and mobile. We also have a JSON file that says, okay, if a test tags shipping failed, then you post a message in this particular Slack channel and you tag specific developers or QAs responsible assigned to that team that's responsible for shipping. Because I don't want to, you know, get a Slack notification, this particular shipping test failed. I have no idea what to do, right? But if a test fails, it says something like this. It says, hey, shipping QA, this test just failed. Go investigate. And a lot of times, the QA, no. Oh, we're running an experiment. Or we should have like added maybe launch darkly flag. Oh wait, we did not deploy a new API, we deployed the front end changes separately. So notify the people who can actually investigate and fix it. Okay, I'm almost at the end. Last thing. I love this picture. I have no idea. Like okay. You want to be able to stop the APIs that are not gonna change because cost of maintenance and changing the test are high. So here's let me oh. Sorry, let me explain. Again, think of a pyramid of all the components. We tested little components like timer, numbers, but we can progressively test larger and larger components all the way where we can import the whole game component. Okay. Remember how we played end-to-end -end test game, right? We visited the URL. We had no control over the board. If we mount the component, game, then we can pass initial and final arrays, and so it looks like this. It's no longer random, we control everything, we just have to fill the first three cells. And we can fill them, and then it looks like this. It just fills three numbers and shows an overlay, you sold it. Okay, so that's all good, except, I apologize. There is a network call that failed, 404. And I was like, why is there a 404? Oh, because my overlay shows the timings. Like I solved it in 90 seconds, for example. Is my timing one of the top first three, or is it like something, right? So the overlay component fetches it. Now, how do you stop it in your test? Maybe you stop fetch. Maybe some import, maybe some class in another method, right? Where do you draw the boundary of your test? If you stop internal code, then you're tying your test to implementation. That's bad. So instead, my advice is stop at the periphery of a browser. In this case, the first command, sci-intercept, is 
marking the API outside the browser. So when my component is making that calls, I'm returning a JSON picture, and then it always responds, and it verifies that what overlay will show my timing correct, okay? And if my implementation changes, nothing else changes, because the backend API is a lot more stable than your source code implementation. Okay, enough of me. I know you're sick. You want to move on with your lives? Summarize. End-to-end -end tests and component tests, unit tests for code that's supposed to run in a browser is supposed to run where? You are such a, you're my best audience so far today. When people use concept of slow and fast test, they use it incorrectly. Think about how fast is it to write test versus how fast it is to run test versus how long it takes to debug a failing test. Running test is easy. You just paralyze it. Debugging, that's where you spend a lot of time and that's where you should optimize for. Maintaining tests, no matter what the you know, level is, is hard. Make sure you understand what the test does by reading it and working on readability. Okay, this presentation is based on my Mercari work. I have done other presentations that are not like this, but cover other aspects of this. This presentation is online. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.